Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Trade Up. I hope you all are doing really well. Through the course of today's lecture, we would be looking at a very phenomenal writer coming from American literature. He's believed to have actually been one of the foremost writers in America to actually start earning a living through professional writings. Uh, and just like Emerson, even he is actually engaging in uh, prose writings, writing essays in order to develop the poetic principles, so to say, of American scholarship. Scholar. So, of course, American Scholar is a work which is written by Emerson, but here we can see that Edgar Allan Poe is actually writing the poetic principle, which is trying to define uh, a new canon, which is trying to resist the European way of putting literature together. So, we are talking about the father of detective fiction in America, the pioneer short story, write, short story writer Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe had actually got a very, um, you can say, not scandalous as such, but definitely not a a very normal life either he married uh, his cousin who was half a, half his age so he was approximately about 31 years old and he got married to his cousin who was only 13 years old um, so of course he had ups and downs he was abandoned by his original parents when he was born in, on 19 January 1809, uh, 1809 when he was born he was abandoned by his family and then he was taken care by the foster family the Allens so that is how he's having this name Edgar Allan Poe uh, so Edgar Allan Poe of course uh, one of the phenomena Phenomenal writers and questions do come. For instance, Nets, uh, you know, Net Exams' favorite pet questions coming from his poetry. Actually, 1845, when The Raven was published, that was the peak of Edgar Allan Poe's career. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was this uh, very interesting question that comes in your exam as to what was the first work. So the first work is actually the namesake of Christopher Marlowe's famous play. But it's actually a, a little different. So it's, it's Tamburlaine. So Tamburlaine and other poems were published by Edgar Allan Poe and that really resulted in a lot of love, affection for language, curiosity for writing and he continues doing that for the rest of his life, okay? So we are going to be looking at Edgar Allan Poe. He once said, all that we see or seem is a dream within a dream. So he's calling life a dream within a dream. According to Edgar Allan Poe, our life is a dream within a dream. So somewhere down the line, echoing the platonic idea of uh, the, uh, like, you know, the idea of forms, the theory of forms, that there's a parallel perfect world which is running around all of us. Um, of course, Edgar Allan Poe, you must remember, he is a path-breaking writer of the macabre, of the gothic tradition. He, he's, he's been, like, you know, he has held this timeless reputation of altering the gothic genre. Gothic literature was very popular at that time. Look at William Wilkie Collins and Charles Dickens. So there were two very important popular best-selling writers writers in England during the time Edgar Allan Poe and uh, sorry William Wilkie Collins Wilkie Collins and Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins is known for writings like the Moonstone you get questions in your net exam or on the Moonstone as well so what we're trying to say is that there was a lot of appetite for ghost horror tales for macabre uh, that was increasing and you know just look a little back uh, you would be able to see that there are novels like Frankenstein being written by Mary Shelley uh, if you just go a little further like you know further back you will be able to see that uh, Jane Austen is also trying to spoof against the gothic tradition of writing so you are able to see that he's carrying forward the American gothic tradition so that is of course a very important pointer with regards to Edgar Allan Poe but he is having a timeless mark a timeless mark vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, when we are talking about American literature in particular and literature English literature in general so that is of course very important uh, you must remember that he's also a source associated with short stories as well as detective fiction as well as detective fish fiction now when you're talking about short stories according to him he laid down the principles to very important principles to cardinal principles according to Edgar Allan Poe which were requ required for creation of the best the best short story what were the two cardinal you get these questions he said the, the short story should actually be completed in one sitting the short story must be completed in one sitting that means if i'm sitting with the book and it is a short story i should finish it and then get up 
right in one sitting it should be completed and the second most important thing he is saying that each and every word of the short story must contribute to the purpose must contribute to the purpose you can write this down according to edgar allan poe who was trying to perfect the short story tradition we will have another extra crash course on the short stories of edgar allan poe but you can actually be mindful of this you can write this point down that edgar allan poe edgar allan poe uh, said he was laying down two very important rules of short story first a short story should be completed within like you know one sitting if i'm sitting for, to read a short story i should be done with it and then only i should get up i should be done with it and then only i should get up and the second important point that he's saying is that each and every word of the short story must contribute to meaning making each and every word that is there in the short story should actually lead to furthering the meaning in the story that was very important and what would this result in this would result in the unity of effect this would result in according to edgar allan poe as the unity of effect there will be an effect on the audience there would be an effect on the readers there would be an effect on people who are consuming literature in general so all these aspects are of course important and there is a sense you know there is this haunting sense that you're having the pictures are gothic the uh, pictures in the sense the imagery that you're able to see it's very gothic in nature it is having the element of macabre that's clearly visible so that's a point that you actually must remember uh besides that please keep this in mind that you know edgar allan poe is actually having a vast canvas he is not just like you know he is not just writing the short stories but he is also writing works of poetry we'll talk about his poetry also rather his poetry is something which is making him very very popular rather his poetry is something which is making him very popular like the raven right in your net exams almost all possible questions <laughs> so sorry almost all possible questions that can actually come from raven have been asked right uh, so it is of course a very interesting work that we are having overall so please do keep that aspect in mind you know there's a lot of violence there's a lot of violence there's an imagery of violence that you're able to see there's horror and ultimately what is edgar allan poe trying to say edgar allan poe is trying to say that the horror resolve inside the mind there is the horror when we are feeling guilty when we think we are exposed uh when we think that you know that we can't really do anything uh so you know because of this aspect the fact that he is getting it all to the mind and the guilt factor he is one of the most uh, early examples of psychologically probing tales he is writing psychologically probing tales uh and of course that is the reason he is actually creating this mark he is he is able to create this uh, mark on the literary landscape which stays uh permanently etched in the minds of the readers which stays permanently etched in the minds of the readers okay and like i said the first ever work that he had actually published was a work called tambelin and other poems and he had actually written uh, it under the name of a bost uh, uh, like you know he said that i am a bostonian uh, he was also born in boston so he said it is written by a bostonian he said that it's written by a bostonian so what i want you to appreciate after like you know going a little over the brief pointers in no way are we going to be able to like you know complete each and every aspect of edgar allan poe but what i want you to remember is a very um, very important thing that you know his career is actually spanning across his career is actually spanning across he is engaged in writing multiple things right we are able to see we are able to situate his works we are able to see the vast canvas that he's writing for example if you look at poetry can someone tell me what all poems has he written can someone very very quickly tell me what all poems has See written very very quickly. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, what all poems have been written by him? Can you, all of you hear me? very good very good yes yes that's right that's right raven of course is coming right raven is of course coming by everyone everyone saying raven is there there's also work called el dorado there's also work called el dorado you know during this time the travelogues were very very popular travelogues were actually very popular and when we are talking about el dorado el dorado is basically a work which is trying to tell us that people were trying to hunt the the golden place the place of the treasure island right arl's 
Stevenson is also writing about the Treasure Island. Uh, so El Dorado is also a very popular work and you get questions coming from El Dorado. There was a question in your exam, right, uh, that he's also invoking the Greek myth. So True he to Helen is also a work of poetry that he's written. So please keep that in mind. And also he's writing, like I told you, the first ever work that's Tambaline. These are very, very important works which are critical from your examination perspective in terms of poetry. Can you tell me some of the very popular short stories that he's written? Of course, the murders, uh, the murder in the Rui Morgue, which is considered to be a tale that started with the Gothic tradition. That is, of course, there. Besides that, can you give me some examples? Besides that, can you give me some examples? And we'll, of course, be discussing more such examples. The tales that are written by Edgar Allan Poe. What are the other examples that we are having of the tales that he is writing? What are the tales that he's writing? What all examples of tales are we having, everyone? Very good, excellent, Shubhangi. Excellent, Black Cat, Fall of Asha, Tiasa. Very good. Uh, yes, very good. Uh, the Fall of the House of Asher, right, 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 right. So actually, Tiasa and Saima, they've done like, you know, a, a mixed venture and they've got the right answer together. So that is absolutely the correct answer. Fall of the House of Asher. Fall of the House of Usher, Fall of the House of Usher, House of Usher, Black Cat, of course, is there, Murders in the Rui Mog is there, Pearl and Letter, absolutely, right? So I think with regards to short story, I'm assuming that, you know, in your syllabuses also, you would have actually covered one of them. And also remember, he's also writing essays, two very important essays that are there. One is called Eureka, a prose poem. Eureka, a prose poem from the examination perspective, it's important. And the other is the 1848 article, The Poetic Principle. The Poetic Principle. The Poetic Principle is, of course, very, very important. The Poetic Principle is, of course, very, very important. Because just like the American scholar written by Emerson, Edgar Allan Poe's The Poetic Principle is also laying the foundations of American history. It is also laying the foundations of American history. Please be mindful of it. Please keep that aspect properly in mind okay all right so now very very quickly with that context in mind that you know this is an american stalwart uh, an american 19th century stalwart who's writing great poetry great prose great short story writings telling you about two important principles of short stories that need to be followed should be read in one sitting Additionally, it should also, uh, each and every word should contribute to creating purpose in the story that will, these two will finally create what is called as your uh, unity of effect, right? With that background, with that context, let's very quickly dive into looking at Edgar Allan Poe. Like I said, he was born on 19th January, 1809, and of course he passed away. 1845 is the peak when he is, his raven is coming in the evening, and the raven is of course becoming like, you know, this, this spectacular work which is getting him all the fame that he had okay uh, now one thing that I want you to remember is that you know in most of the books that we read about Edgar Allan Poe you will be able to see that he's treated as a professional writer who was able to generate income and one of the first writers to get a living out of his writings but Edgar Allan Poe himself said that he could not make enough money of course he was making money from his writings but it wasn't enough which tells us about the fact that you know the publishers definitely want wanted to publish your works during that time but they were not ready to pay for the work right they were not ready to pay for the work that was of course another important thing so he is an american literary critic poet author writer that we are having for all of you he is associated with the romantic movement now i want all of you to pause over here for a minute and understand okay uh, if you already know about it that is amazing okay if you already know about it that is uh, fantastic so you don't really have to worry about anything but you know when we are looking at america uh, when we are looking at america all right you must actually keep that in mind that you know uh, approximately the beginning of 17th century till say 1776 till 1776 uh, till america's independence till america's independence we are able to see the early period in america there is the early period in america here you are having writers right here you are having writers like anne bradstreet you are having phyllis whiteley all these writers are writing anne bradstreet 
Edward Taylor, Phyllis Whiteley. These writers are writing and this is considered to be the early period of American writings. This is considered to be the early period of American writings, 1776 all the way till approximately 1820, all the way till 1820 is considered to be the period of American Enlightenment. Why is it American Enlightenment? It is because of the fact, right? It is because of the fact that America is writing, it's getting independence, uh, right, from the colonizers. Uh, remember here, James Fenimore Cooper is also writing, all right? Uh, so this particular juncture, American Enlightenment is actually a period where America has got independence and they are trying to form a new nation. They are trying to form a new nation. They're trying to build a new nation. There's declaration of rights writes, there's Thomas Paine writing, there's Benjamin Franklin writing, there's Crevacore writing, Hector D. Crevacore writing. Uh, we're also having the writings which are telling you about American enlightenment as a movement. So America is trying to frame itself. America is trying to define the American dream. America is trying to tell you there's a very important concept of American dream that means you can actually transform yourself the minute you land the minute you land in America you can actually you're capable of uh, you're, you're capable of forming yourself you're capable of forming an identity for yourself. Okay, so this is basically the period of American enlightenment. But unfortunately, literature is not of any merit during this period. There's no merit in the literature of the time. There's absolutely no merit in the literature of the time. Now, what is happening is that people have understood people are either copying, all right, or they are trying to, uh, they're, they're, they're just trying to look at European writings. Uh, and that's a major problem. That's a major problem. Thus, to tackle this problem, 1820 to 1860, is a period very popularly called as American Romanticism. This period is very, very popularly called as American Romanticism. And why is it called American Romanticism? It's called American Romanticism because it's trying to find an American voice which is actually indigenous, unique and not imitating the Europeans. It wants to find a unique voice of America and that is when writers like Emerson are talking about the American scholar that is when they, what are they talking about they are discussing about american scholar they are talking about american scholar they are telling you about american scholar what are the conditions required for an american scholar who can a poet be in america how can you change the way americans are writing they're just imitating the Western counterpart. So that is a major discussion that is taking place. That is one of the major discussions that is taking place during this particular period. And you must remember that. Okay. Uh, so that is a period. And after this, of course, for your knowledge, you can write it down. 1860 all the way, say, uh, till about, you know, approximately 1914 is the period of American naturalism and realism. Then from 1914 all the way till 1945 is American modernism. And 1945... To, till date is actually American postmodernism. Okay, so please remember these are higher, uh, these are markations for your own understanding. These are markations for your own understanding so that you understand American literature better. So American Romanticism is a time period where we are able to see that Edgar Allan Poe is actually very active, right? He is associated with Romantic movement. Very quickly, I want all of you to tell me what are some of the features of uh, American Romanticism movement what are some of the features of american romantic movement slash transcendentalism what are they what are they yes very good what are they yes very quickly Very good, very good, very good. Excellent, excellent. Fantastic, fantastic. Yes, there's a quest for identity. Nature is there, Jamila. Very good. Suraj, Shubhangi. Very nice, very nice. Everyone's given the right answers. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, this romantic movement is actually not going back to nature. It is not going back to nature as a source of inspiration. So sorry, I was just about to hit my laptop. Okay, right. It's not going back to nature as a source of in uh, uh, inspiration. It is trying to define what is an American writer all about American identity. They're trying to define American identity, American scholars, American way of writing. They're trying to find a unique American 
American voice. They want to find a unique American voice, which is not trying to copy, which is not trying to copy from the Europeans at all. Right. Because according to them, it's a different reality. Secondly, they want to capture. They want to capture American dream. But at the same time, there are they are also capturing that. Unfortunately, American dream has now become materialism. American dream has now become materialism. It's only materialism. Therefore, this romantic movement is also associated with transcendentalism. This American movement, uh, this American romanticism movement is also associated with transcendentalism in which Emerson and Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau writing Walden and civil disobedience, right? Henry David Thoreau writing Walden and civil disobedience is actually trying to inspire people all across by trying to tell you that it's not good to be materially uh, focused. It's not. Remember, the world is too much with us. Uh, classroom students, the world is too much with us. How was your quiz? Okay, anyway, we'll discuss about this. The world is too much with us, right? The world is too much for us. So what is this telling us? There we're able to see that Wordsworth is also trying to critique materialism. There's a criticism of materialism and consumer culture that has already started. That is exactly what we are able to see in the world is too much with us also, right? In the world is too much with us also, we are able to see that there's a criticism. There's a criticism of the consumer culture, materialism, hoarding. What were we all criticizing? The hoarding of vaccinations by some people. So this period is also trying to be very critical of American dream. It is trying to put American dream under scanner. That American dream does not really mean that you're just having acquisition ab uh, abilities, that you're just going on acquiring wealth and, uh, you know, you're just trying to increase your cash. That's not American dream. American dream is to have meaningful, purposeful careers. So that is another very important point that we're able to observe over here that comes across brilliantly during American romanticism. And of course, all of you are right. This is the time of American romances. Remember when we were looking at Moby Dick? We discussed that American romances are not tales which are dealing with nature or which are telling you tales of chivalry. American romances are dark, bleak horror stories. They are dark, bleak stories to shock everyone. Remember yesterday we said that the avant-garde literature is using shock tactics. The avant-garde literature, what is it using? The avant-garde literature is actually using shock tactics right so please keep that aspect properly in mind and just collaborate the uh, you know the features of romantic movement as well and according to uh, you know according to F.O. Matheson this romantic period is just not transcendentalism it is also American renaissance it is also American renaissance and according to him five major thinkers that includes Emerson Haro, that includes uh, your Herman Melville, that includes Nathalie Hawthorne, as well as Walt Whitman. They're all contributing to what is called American Renaissance. And Edgar Allan Poe is also by default a part of this category because he's also trying to invent. He's also trying to invent. Very popular for mystery and macabre stories. Macabre is actually dealing with horrifying us. These are very similar to your Gothic tradition that you are having, the Gothic tradition that you are having, right? The Gothic Gothic tradition uh, in poetry, it was called the graveyard school of poetry, right? Gothic tradition is trying to scare us. It's trying to horrify us, again, using shock tactics. But it was also trying to uh, cater to the audience's appetite for such kind of literature, okay? Uh, he's, of course, looking at short stories. Very quickly tell me, what are the two important features? What are the two important features according to Edgar Allan Poe in a short story? Very quickly, please tell me. Yes, yes. Right. What are the two important? What are the two important features of short stories? Yes, absolutely, Suraj. Emily Bronte is also using the Gothic tradition. That is true. One, absolutely, it should be fit, uh, it should be completed in one sitting. The second, the second point. Yes, Suraj, very good. Tiasa, very good. Each and every word, each and every word should actually contribute to the purpose. It is not a novel where I'm having the luxury of writing multiple words. So therefore, if it's a short story, then each and every word, each and every word must actually contribute to the meaning. Each and every word must actually contribute to the meaning of the short story. He is also considered to be the inventor of detective fiction, particularly in America. 
all right so he's making a lot of changes in american literature therefore we say he's having a timeless mark in the literary history he's having a timeless mark in the literary history that is what you have to remember okay unfortunately he was abandoned by his family but he had foster parents he had foster parents he had a lot of bitter tussle with them also uh, but nonetheless that continues for the rest of his life okay uh, unfortunately you know because there was a tussle between him and his foster pa parents his foster family therefore he could not actually complete his unit university right his university was not something that was completed and the most important first collection is coming in the form of tamblin and other poems tamblin and other poems and he is using he is signing it off as a bostonian tamblin and other poems what is he doing he's signing off his works that is the pseudonym that he is using or he's signing off signing off that means this is the name that he is writing he's signing off this work as a bostonian he's signing off his work as a bostonian that is what he's doing right we will be looking at tamblin very very briefly right now but the path breaking success is something that he's able to achieve i think i've dropped water anyway the path breaking success that he's managed to achieve is because of the publication of the work called the raven the The Raven is changing his destiny in terms of the literature. Uh, we remember uh, Edgar Allan Poe, or we read about Edgar Allan Poe because of the Raven. It became instantly successful. It was first appearing in the Evening Mirror, right? We will also briefly talk about the Raven and how Raven is actually trying to, you know, fit the bill of a gothic, uh, gothic work of writing. So in that particular sense, it's trying to trying to tell us more about Edgar Allan Poe and his style of writing. Okay. uh he of course got married he of course got married right uh, now you know also remember he had actually uh, fudged his age so when he was going to the military when he was going to the military he was 22 years old but he said my age was 18 years old uh, so he he had also done a little bit of fudging of age uh, in order to get his uh, like you know get that particular job so that was also done by him uh, that is something that you were able to observe and he, he got married to his cousin who was only 13 years old okay uh, so that was of course there Uh, now please keep this in mind that he is also writing he is also writing short stories he is writing works of poetry he is writing prose works so he is basically a writer who is engaged in all three types of writing he is engaged in all three types of writings okay uh, he was also writing for a journal called the pen you can get this question right he was writing for the journal uh, that was called the pen now a uh, one very important part that you should all remember about edgar allan poe is that you know he is not just trying to he is not just trying to make changes in the gothic uh, style of writing but he is also trying to experiment but predominantly till date we remember him as a person who changed the gothic writing tradition completely and entirely right that is what you are able to see uh, and what we were able to observe is that he was borrowing he was borrowing raven he was borrowing raven from elizabeth barrett's poem uh, elizabeth barrett's poem was actually the source of raven and also barnaby rudge barnaby rudge was uh, something that further inspired was inspired by this work i have a question for all of you uh, that which work and and i think some of you must have attempted the quiz yesterday so you can answer this question uh, which work of uh, so so when we are talking about the songs uh, the songs and sonnets of portuguese right what was the earlier name what was the earlier name of elizabeth barrett its uh, barrett browning's poetry collection what was the earlier name of a poetry collection ranjana the unity of effect is actually he wanted to create this effect on his audience and according to him that is only possible that is only possible if you are trying to grip them if you are trying to grip them excellent excellent pratibha bishnoi has answered this question correctly pratibha pratibha bishnoi has absolutely correctly answered this question i hope all of you have attempted that quiz and both uh, uh, you remembered also uh suraj what what is the same what what names are the same okay anyway yes absolutely absolutely that is the right answer that is the right answer i hope all of you are when you're giving the quizzes also you're trying to make a point right you're trying to make a point also that is right that is right so so they were they were very good now shubhangi is also giving the right answer so you know the the sonnets when we are talking about sonnets from portuguese sonnets of portuguese are a collection of how many sonnets 44 sonnets elizabeth barrett browning's elizabeth barrett browning's sonnets 
sonnets from portuguese is actually a collection uh, it's actually a collection of 44 sonnets it's actually a collection of 44 sonnets and these are love sonnets what are these these are love sonnets that we are talking about right and what were they previously called they were called sonnets from bosnian they were called sonnets from bosnian but it is believed it is believed that or when you know she consulted sonnets from bosnian that was the original title for sonnets from portuguese uh, so when she had consulted robert browning that you know what do you think about the work robert browning it is believed that he suggested that you know he used to call him there was a nickname my little portuguese my little portuguese so he had recommended that you should actually call it sonnets from portuguese right he recommended that you should call it sonnets from portuguese but earlier the title was sonnets from bosnian earlier the title was sonnets from bosnian okay so do remember that do keep that aspect in mind whenever you know whenever you get any question if you have actually practiced something uh, a day or two prior try to recollect that and that is how you will be able to create an impact so raven's title is actually getting uh, you know we're getting raven's title from elizabeth barrett's pro- poem the geraldness courtship so please keep that aspect properly in mind okay now when we are talking about el dorado when we are discussing we'll very briefly talk about it because you know we will be having one second we will be having uh, your uh, session again because you know we will we'll be talking about short stories and short stories is uh, predominantly a really important topic that all of you should actually be covering right uh, because it does becomes important just one second i will just see so uh, so of course whenever we are discussing about the lesser known works the shorter works that we are having we are of course having all these works like el dorado and el dorado was very very popular why was el dorado very very popular okay this is the only one okay right uh, i don't think so we need to worry too much about it okay now why was el dorado very very popular el dorado was very popular because you know it was telling you about this entire decision of going back and excavating right it was telling you about a quest it was telling you about the quest metaphor the quest metaphor the travel log which was becoming very very popular and and that too what are you searching for you're actually uh, you must have actually seen pirates of the caribbean also what are pirates doing pirates are actually searching for gold pirates are actually searching for gold so el dorado is a work which is written by edgar allan poe which is trying to deal with the quest metaphor then of course his first most important work that is tamblin and other poems so tamblin and other poems is actually the first collection of published work that we have for edgar allan poe or the first important collection of published work that we have for edgar allan poe it is a dramatic monologue it is a dramatic monologue that he had written which got published in 1827 under the name of tamblin and other poems okay now what are we able to see we're able to see that you know he's he's clearly clearly getting influenced by the romantic poets of the time he was really influenced by lord byron remember we had talked about memorial verses by arnold where arnold is actually trying to pay tribute to three important romantic poets who are the three important romantic poets whom matthew arnold is paying tribute in memorial verses Yes, yes, Shubangi. Of course, very similar to Walter Raleigh also. Yes, very quickly. Who are the three poets uh, who are actually getting uh, like you know? Th- there's a homage that is being paid in memorial verses. Excellent. Very good, Shalini. Na- uh, Nayika. Nayika has also given. Nayika has also given the right answer. Very good. Yeah, she is giving the right answer. Goethe, Goethe, Byron, and Wordsworth. Goethe, Byron, and Wordsworth. These are the three romantic poets that Matthew Arnold is actually paying a tribute to in his work. Right? Matthew Arnold is actually paying tribute to them in his work called Memorial Verses, which is actually a tribute written on the death of William Wordsworth, or trying to tell you that you know Wordsworth is uh, physically perhaps alive, but he's also dead as a leader. Okay. So that is of course there. Now the narrator of Tamburlaine or of Tamburlaine is Taimur. Right. Right, so Tamburlaine is having this narrator called Temur, and Temur is a Turkish conqueror. Remember, Tamburlaine is also a work written by Christopher Marlowe in two parts. Xenocrates is a character that you have in the work. Again, uh, Tamburlaine is telling us about the rise of Tamburlaine, his quest for power, but finally his death is eventually, uh, like you know, shown and presented. And remember, we discussed about the Marlowian heroes. The Marlowian heroes were actually having this desire of overreaching. The 
the marlovian heroes were actually having this desire of overreaching you could actually see that they were trying to overreach right so that is of course something that you had absolutely absolutely okay so do keep that in mind that tamblin is actually telling you about the turkish conqueror and this turkish conqueror is making his deathbed confession he is making a deathbed confession to a friar this was also a very common theme remember sohrab and rustam is also by matthew arnold is also trying to take a uh, like you know an asian story a persian story is taken over there and here a turkish conqueror story is taken and uh, of course he tells of his return to his native village right and uh, how he he felt really bad that his innocence was lost <clears throat> so tamblin is telling us about the confession made by taimur about his loss of innocence the confession that taimur is making about the loss of innocence right the confession that is being made by taimur because are uh, telling him about the loss of innocence right so that is what you are able to see that is what you are able to look at over here in this work okay the raven of course is the most important this was uh, at the peak of his career this was at the peak of his career published in 1845 the raven and other poems the raven and other poems that you have it it was an instant success it actually captured him it created uh, like you know it it ensured that he was actually reaching this pedestal that you were able to see so that was of course there <clears throat> now what is there is that there is a stormy december midnight this question has also come all right now there's a grieving student there's a grieving student who's actually visited by a raven who refuses this raven refuses to go away and this raven is speaking one word never more this is a refrain this is a figure of speech which is called a refrain repetition being repeated again and again and again and again okay and as the student is actually lamenting the student is crying the student is lamenting his lost love lenor right he is trying to literally trying to cry about the fact that there's this lost love lenor uh what you're able to see over here is clearly that you know this is trying to give us a very macabre setting there is a macabre setting at the very beginning of the work itself that we are introduced to the raven is there there's a stormy december midnight uh, never more is repeated the grieving student there's a grieving student who's lamenting the loss of his lost lenor uh, so you are of course able to see that okay now the poem has got 18 six line stanzas there are 18 six line stanzas so six line stanzas are called ses- state they're also called sestinas so your six line stanza forms what are they called they're called sestinas or they're also called sestate uh, classroom students i hope you remember yesterday the rhetoric and prosody class okay uh, that is what we were looking at the first five lines the first five lines are in trochiac octameter they are in trochiac octameter very very quickly i want everyone to tell me iambic trochi and spondy especially yashika if you are there i want you to tell me arasmata if you are there i want you to tell me both you should definitely tell me uh, the rest of course you can tell me i want you all to quickly tell me remember this is what we did at 3 pm i am big trochi and spondy very quickly very very quickly please yes absolutely absolutely raven yes raven was inspiring the only historical uh, like you know so so there are there are there are basically uh, two major works which are actually historically uh, inked or historical lineage is there when we are talking about charles dickens one is the tale uh, the tale of two cities and the other one's barnaby rudge and barnaby rudge is of course getting inspired by this work and uh, tale of two cities is actually getting inspired by thomas carlyle's the french revolution so you can write this point also So at the top of your notebook there are two historical novels written by Charles Dickens one is Barnaby Rudge which is dealing with the Gordon riots and the other one is actually this work which is called the tale of two cities tale of two cities is inspired by Thomas Carlyle the prose writer of Victorian age the french revolution and Barnaby Rudge is inspired by the raven written by Edgar Allan Poe excellent very good af very good excellent fantastic yashika's answered or yashika's not there yashika you there yashi is it yashi is yashika Okay um uh, Rasmita was it you who was not getting it or was it someone else who was not getting it okay um great 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 fantastic fantastic from pratibha krishna everyone has answered it correctly very good everyone all right fantastic so iambic is unstressed stressed so iambic is a feat which is having two syllables one is unstressed the other is stressed trochi is the opposite of iambic it is stressed and unstressed and we can also call it accented and unaccented all right accented and unaccented spondy is when both are stressed stressed right spondy is when both are stressed. 
stressed stress so this is trochiac this is trochiac tetrameter three times remember pentameter is coming five times trochiac so trochiac is actually s and uh, unstressed right and this is coming this is coming three times this is coming three times so i hope it is clear to all of you that this is how we are actually looking at right this is how we are actually looking at keep on revising now whenever you are looking at the, these kind of words try to ask yourself do you remember what is iambic do you remember what is trochiac do you remember what is spondy do you remember what is anapaest do you remember what is dactylic so you should actually keep on asking yourself and after the rhetoric and prosody um, marathon session uh, Uh, you will also be able to identify masculine rhymes and feminine rhymes okay so that will also be very very clear okay uh, okay this is not yashika is not yashi okay okay yashika is yashi only so yashi bachche i hope now it is clear thoda 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 and yashika keep that chart that i have told you at in front of you the rhyme scheme is a b c b b b a b c b b b so sestina sestina six line stanza form your sestina is being used a b c b b b all right uh, so this is actually uh, adding uh, to the gloom that you are having now edgar allan poe had written an essay called the philosophy of composition philosophy of composition was trying to tell us that you know any work of art needs to be put across needs to be put across in the best manner possible. possible uh you know uh, there were many writers and this is actually a question that has come in your exam there were many many writers there were many many writers who were writing horror tales macabre tales gothic tales but why was uh, why was uh, Chos- uh, sorry why was edgar allan poe very popular because edgar allan poe was extremely particular about style and form and this is something that he is even trying to talk about in his essay the philosophy of composition that how you can't really take your readers for granted you need to create work which is painstakingly made so style and form is equally important style and form is equally important that is what you have to keep in mind okay before we go further let's do a uh, like you know a quick quiz let's do a quick quiz and then we'll call it a day right kartika they are actually there in poetic principle also uh, because in poetic principle he briefly mentions about this but yes of course here also he is talking about it chalo quickly answer what is the right answer two of the following and today i want all of you i hope you have looked at 2004 december paper that was your homework last time today your homework is you have to go over the 2014 paper i will tell you whether it's december or june i will let you know on the telegram channel but i want you to definitely do this paper today okay two of the following list two of the following list are angry young men of 1950s british literary scene what is the right answer very very quickly what is the right answer you got the poll please look to look at the poll try to use the poll and then answer the question what is the correct answer two of the following list are angry young men of 1950s who are they who are they whom are we talking about what is the correct answer What is the 85% of you are actually getting it right? John Osborn is angry young man for sure. So any option that is not having Osborn kindly delete that. Kindly use the elimination method. Okay? CP Snow when you are talking about Charles Percy Snow, he is not an angry young man writer. What is CP Snow? CP Snow is actually talking about two cultures. What is he talking about? He is telling us about two cultures. He is telling us about the matrimony of humanities and sciences. He says that you know humanities and sciences have to come together you can't really work in isolated chambers and that is actually the birth of liberal arts in foreign universities also okay anthony powell is also not the correct answer but kingsley uh, so you can also eliminate the second option wherever cp snow is there you can eliminate that and amongst these two anthony powell is also not the right answer but kingsley am is the writer associated with Kang- uh, you know these are all writers associated with movement these are all writers so kingsley ames is also associated with campus novel tradition in the form of lucky jim which is a must read work and kingsley ames kingsley ames and his son martin ames that is also important both are associated with the book of prize also um, okay so kingsley ames and john osborn this is the correct answer so c is definitely the right answer angry young man movement uh, it is actually one of the most important pioneering movement of the 20th century you must also remember about 
kitchen sink drama you should also remember about the collapse of fourth wall theater and look back in anger and lucky jim are two classic cult works that we are having when we are looking at both osborn and kingsley amis so please remember that please quickly tell us what is the right answer lawrence stern's tristram shandy contains how many volumes lawrence stern's tristram shandy is containing how many volumes very very quickly please Neha, bache, it's Neerja, UGC Net English. I have okay. I have also shared today Rotilich with all of you. Please start studying Rotilich in the month of July. <coughs> we are also sorry coming up with sessions wherein we will try to regularly cover Rotilich. Okay, <coughs> so sorry. Very quickly, please. What is the right answer? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Very good, very good. Okay, that is the right answer. Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy is containing nine volumes. This is a net question, Tristram Shandy. Uh, all your novels, all your novels are important, especially the ones like uh, Lawrence Stern, um, right, or uh, Tobias Smollett, Henry Fielding, uh, uh, Samuel Richardson. The early writers of novel, Daniel Defoe, they're all important, and you must cover them. So this is a work written in nine volumes. Okay, very quickly, which of the following statement is not true for Aragopactica? First of all, Aragopactica is a name. First of all, Aragopactica is a name. I want all of you to quickly tell me, Aragopactica is a name which was inspired by which scholar? By which scholar? Very very quickly, remember Isocrates. Isocrates is the scholar from whose name we are actually able to see uh, Aragopactica is getting inspired. And what are we talking about? We are talking about the sixteen. 43 licensing act which was not giving the freedom of press so arico pactica is a pamphlet which is trying to tell us arico pactica is a pamphlet which is trying to tell us against right uh, which is trying to fight against the freedom of uh, press remember iconoclast 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 is actually iconoclast uh, is actually the essay which is written by milton which is trying to justify it is trying to justify the killing and beheading of charles the 1st the pamphlets are all important on divorce that is also important he was fed up with his wife right so that is there the second okay uh, the second question is being asked let's see Okay, quickly come on to the third question, everyone. Quickly come on to the third. Okay, I can't see. There's this poll which is coming. I'm closing the poll, but it's not getting closed. What is this? I don't understand. Oh ho! I'm not able to see your comments actually. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Uh, so here, absolutely, absolutely. This is the right answer. Which of the following statement is not true? C is absolutely the right answer. It was published in 1643 as a reply to the Licensing Act of 1643. everyone i hope that is clear it argues for liberty of unlicensed printing that is absolutely true it pleads for british privileges regarding free trade there is no mention of free trade it is a speech addressed to the parliament of england that is true it is a speech it, it was a pamphlet which was delivered as a part of speech remember milton milton is becoming blind when is milton becoming blind 1651 is when he is becoming blind in completely before that he is a statesman before that he is a statesman right that is what you are able to observe okay and andrew marvel is saving the life of milton andrew marvel saves the life of john milton so c is the right answer here c is the right answer here thomas hardy's last major novel i have repeated it a gazillion number of times hardy is a must read writer you get questions coming from hardy's novels poems how he is trying to represent the pessimism of the late victorian century what is the last major novel that he had written after which he had actually given up writing after to which he'd actually given up writing what is the right answer oh god the time also okay very quickly please tell me what is the right answer here Okay, fantastic, fantastic, right? Jute obscure is absolutely the correct answer. Otherwise, Tess of the Uber Wheels uh, is uh, again a must-read work. So all the works of Hardy actually have to be on your fingertips. William Makepeace Thackeray, Hardy. Basically, you get uh, you know 
uh, the unfortunate part is we spend a lot of time on 19th century novel but 19th century novel is definitely worth uh, like you know spending and investing your time because that's the backbone of novels uh, you will definitely get about two to three questions for sure from 19th century novels so do make it a try to like you know wrap this portion up and no need to go into greater details but just have the cursory idea of at least all the text okay and that is where the oxford companion can also come handy okay let's come on to the next question the hind and the panther traverse to the story of the country mouse and the city mouse is a satire on it is a satire on <clears throat> no worries the bastum what is this a satire on <coughs> so sorry i don't know why is my loss is gone What is it a satire on? Yes, John Dryden is the right answer. John Dryden is the right answer. Majority, wow, the polls are also going nice, huh? All of you are answering correctly. Majority, or is it after looking at the polls are you answering, huh? Are you answering after looking at the polls, or are you writing? Uh, sort of, all of them are available in the market, and they're all brilliant books on American writings. But I would still suggest that if you go over internet resources, that will definitely be a better idea. But otherwise, all the books are available in the market. There are Orion Black Swan having two books of American writings. You you may consult those. also okay all right fantastic uh, john dryden is the right answer john dryden is the right answer just in the benefit of time we're not elaborating but let's do one or two more question match the columns match the columns right you have to match the columns these are the theory writers and these are the concepts these are the concepts so you have to basically match them you have to basically match them for example apollinian and dionysian who has given this concept Apollinian and Dionysian who has given this concept <clears throat> who has given the uh, this concept of Apollinian and Dionysian very very quickly yeah you know uh, i even i was not able to see your answers because of the polls even i'm getting that <laughs> over here right absolutely so see here if you look at it here if you look at it this is nietzsche this is nietzsche so one has to be two one has to be two because frederick nietzsche is number two so whichever is not two whichever is not two that will be deleted ab ye you know that second is supposed to be four because four is there in both of them right so fancy and imagination is a concept given by coleridge fancy Fancy and imagination is a concept given by Coleridge, so we don't really have to worry about it. Hellenism and Hebrewism is a concept which is given by Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold is a person giving us the concept of Hellenism and Hebrewism, and that is number one. So we come to know that A is the right answer. We come to know that A is the right answer, and absolutely right. Inscape and instress is actually something which is used by J. M. Hopkins. Gerard Manley Hopkins is using it. This is M. You, this is a typo error. You can rectify that. Hopkins is actually using this. Okay, uh, we will stop over here just in the interest of time. Just in the interest of time, we will stop over here. Uh, please make it a point that you are revising a majority of things that we have looked at uh, in today's session. And if you are having any concerns, any problems, please feel free to uh, let us know about that through the doubt platform on the Grade Up application. Great. So we will stop over here. I will see you guys tomorrow. And uh, please start reading Rotelich, which I which I've shared at the you uh, at the on the Telegram platform because that will really build. Build a strong foundation for all of you for the upcoming classes that we'll be scheduling in the next month. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Take good care of yourself, and if you have any concerns, any problems, please do let us know. Okay, all right. Bye, guys. See you. One second. I'll just stop the class. Thank you. Bye, guys. Stop streaming.